Well, hey there. Uh, we got a few more minutes till you guys get to experience Genesis, so uh, gonna need something for you guys to do. Hey, Ralph. Yo. The vision of this film, what are you hoping to accomplish? We're trying to show that the Bible is true, but also the science to yes. back it up. If we're gonna have a debate about science, can you please just be honest about it? Ologia presents The Science of Genesis, Paradise Lost. Part 12, Veggiesaurus. If you're new to the series, click on the I in the top corner to watch from the beginning. One of the common misconceptions that exists in society is that they say that humans and chimps are 99% similar. Depending on the study and methodology, I've been able to find numbers anywhere from 96% to 99% similarity in the DNA of humans and chimpanzees. But I suspect that Andrew isn't looking to quibble over 3%. I am very disillusioned by the idea of using a percentage to describe how similar humans and chimps are. You cannot use a percent similarity to describe common ancestry. I have discussed this with geneticists, and they generally agree that while percentage similarity is a useful way to communicate the concept, no single number can express all of the subtleties. For example, most people would probably agree to a method of expressing percent similarity in these two sentences where one letter is different. But what about these two sentences, where the word brown appears twice? How similar are they? One word difference? Five letter difference? Everything after the third word different because it's not aligned? Or this one where one word is missing? Is that one difference or many? Evolutionary biologists use many metrics in determining ancestry relationships. These insertion, deletions, and transposition events are the most interesting. Molecular phylogenetics focuses on model-based analysis where variations in the data are measured against the predictions of models of sequence evolution. It's not too surprising that our chromosomes would look a lot the same as a chimpanzee's. Of all other living things, their biochemistry, their physiology, their body structures look the most like us. Their DNA ought to look the most like us too. For goodness sake, bananas have DNA that's 50% the same as ours. So that monkeys should have 80, 90, 98% the same DNA, their bodies look that much like ours. Wait, the movie cut from someone saying DNA percentages are suspect to someone else telling us the DNA percentages are exactly what is expected. Which is it? One of the most popular misconceptions held by evolutionists is that birds evolved from dinosaurs. What proof do they have, you might ask? Well, just look at their similar design, they might say. They might say that. But scientists generally don't speak of design other than in a casual sense. They'd be more likely to point out common traits, divergent traits, and how these vary over time. Pointing out that both birds and some dinosaurs have hollow bones. They might also point out skeletal similarities in the neck, pubis, shoulder blade, clavicle, and breast bones. Theropod lung air sacs being closer to birds than reptiles. That over 30 species of non-avian dinosaurs have been found with feathers or protofeathers. Both have gastroliths gizzard stones in the digestive system, that there is a progression of hand configuration, shrinking then losing fifth and fourth digits, the first and second digit fusion allowing for the wing joint movement that creates thrust, and that the T-Rex soft tissue osteocytes the movie was so excited about bind only with modern avian proteins, not with reptile proteins. They might further point to species like Archaeopteryx that may seem bird-like, but simultaneously have reptile features like teeth and a bony tail. That's just to name a few. It's not just hollow bones. But common features can also be understood as evidence for a common designer who didn't need to reinvent the wheel every time he created a new kind. If you posit an all-powerful being who could create using literally any method, then affirmation of a particular method doesn't actually lend evidence to that hypothesis. If we're playing a game of guess my number between 1 and 1,000, and the first person guesses 682, while the second person guesses the set of all possible integers, and my number is indeed 682, the second person can delude themselves into thinking they made an equally good prediction, but they clearly did not. Since an all-powerful god could just as easily have made each kind entirely genetically unique with no additional effort on his behalf, that would be much stronger evidence for a creator, since it would entirely rule out evolution with common ancestry. If God is the creator, he chose a creation method that is indistinguishable from evolution. Humans and frogs both have five digits on their lower limbs. As do horses, cats, bats, birds, and whales. But that doesn't mean frogs and humans share a common ancestor. This study in 2010 was among the first to sequence the genome of the frog, specifically Xenopus tropicalis. Not only were the similarities between frogs and humans striking, as well as chickens, as happened to be included in the study, 
they found over 1,700 genes in the frog that match genes in humans associated with specific diseases such as cancer, asthma, and heart disease. Of course, from an evolutionary perspective, this is easily explained by a common ancestor of the frog and the human having these gene sequences which were then passed along to both lines. But if you believe that humans and frogs were created perfectly, then these disease genes can't be part of the original creation and instead must be the result of harmful gene mutations that began with original sin. Much like rolling two clay pots down a flight of stairs, we are unsurprised that both are broken. But we would be very surprised to find that both clay pots broke exactly the same way, into the same number of pieces in precisely the same shapes, right down to the molecular level. So it is with frog and human DNA. While one can potentially explain remarkable genetic similarities with a common designer, it is very difficult to explain identical undesigned damage taking place after the initial design was complete. For this, only common ancestry makes sense. Unless you believe fairy tales, of course. I'm not sure that the film with the book about talking snakes should attempt to belittle findings by calling them fairy tales. If we're having an honest presentation about science, let's stick to science. God made the world perfect. There was no death or bloodshed according to Genesis 1, 29, 30. Originally, all the animals were vegetarian and mankind was vegetarian. When being told that all animals were created to be vegetarian, one's mind naturally turns to all the carnivore-specific features found in the animal kingdom. Sharp, serrated teeth, speed for the hunt, claws to kill, inability to synthesize essential nutrients on their own, and a physiology that can't digest plant matter. The animation segments of the film gives a tip of the hat to this, depicting a fierce T-Rex stomping toward the camera with its curved, serrated, perfect for killing teeth, lunging toward us in full 3D effect, only to cut away at the last second to said T-Rex pulling a watermelon-like fruit dangling from the branch of a tree. Just as an aside on watermelons, they grow from vines on the ground, not hanging high. An average watermelon weighs 20 pounds, far too heavy to be dangling from the flimsy branches presented. I know the film wants us to rethink what God might have done with biology, but surely the laws of physics would still apply. Eric's T-Rex gulps the watermelon down without chewing, making me wonder why it needed an entire mouthful of teeth to merely pluck a fruit that won't fight back. It's not so much that carnivorous features can't work in other situations, but rather that the entire creationist movement argues for perfection in design and purpose, when clearly what is being proposed is that God made creatures designed to eat meat but had them make do to be vegetarians for a while. This tells me that before God created people, he adapted his animal design in advance to be best suited for life after sin that had not yet occurred. This golden age of the past, reported to us accurately in the Bible, is remembered in the legends of human cultures throughout our history. The reason we call certain stories legends is that they are acknowledged to be fictional, not true, or based on a true story that has become exaggerated over time. Where man and animals grew to be larger and live much longer than we do today. Of course, among the easiest details to exaggerate is size and age. We'll talk later about size, but the claim here of legendary advanced age is not supported by any empirical evidence. As far as we know, human lifespans have only lengthened over the centuries. Scientific discoveries reveal fossil representatives of every major kind of plant and animal that are many times larger than their present day counterparts. It's not clear to me why larger animals would indicate that animals are closer to perfection. Fossil insects as large as modern dogs. The largest known insects were the Meganeuropsis griffin flies, with up to 27 inch wingspans. The Picurtinensis scorpion is thought to have reached over 2 feet in length, and there are other pretty crazy examples. During the Carboniferous and Permian periods, Earth's air contained 31 to 35 percent oxygen, as compared to just 21 percent oxygen in the air today, and the climate is also estimated to have been warmer and moister. Since insects don't have lungs, but rely on air flowing through spherical openings across their bodies for oxygen, their potential size is directly proportional to oxygen in the air. Such giant insects were fine then, but could not survive today. Fossil birds with 25-foot wingspans. Close enough. The largest wingspan of any fossil found is the single specimen we have for Pelagornis and Dersi, measuring 24 feet, dating back about 25 million years. And fish as big as our modern whales. The estimated size of the lead Sichthus was once in the 90 foot long range, based on incomplete skeletons, which would have put the fish close to the size of whales. However, newer research since 2013 suggests the adults were probably more like 26 to 50 feet long. Still massive and still the largest species of fish known, but not quite whale category. 
So if evolution's true, you've got millions of years of death before man sinned to bring about death. We really have a huge theological problem if we accept those millions of years. This sentence demonstrates the problem with science proposed in this movie and in the young earth creation view in general. If evolution is true, we have a theology problem. Since we can't have a theology problem, evolution is false. The consequences of an idea are irrelevant to the truth of the idea. If a cancer diagnosis means I'm going to die sooner, and I don't want to die sooner, my wishes have no effect on the actual cancer cells. If you eat nothing but chocolate, you will gain weight. But if you don't want to get fat, that desire doesn't somehow make the chocolate have no calories. First, we need to look and see if evolution is true, and then only afterward consider what the theological consequences might be and adjust from there. From here, there's still 22 minutes of movie left, but none of it is scientific claims, unless you count the scenes of Adam petting a dinosaur. This last act of the film is dedicated to presenting the gospel message, bringing in evangelist Ray Comfort to try to seal the deal. Perhaps as an homage to Ray, the next scene of the Garden of Eden includes modern bananas, Ray's signature blunder from decades past, where he failed to realize that modern bananas have never existed in nature, but were instead selectively bred from other fruits with large, hard seeds. Assuming there was a Garden of Eden, modern bananas would not have been there, just as the relatively recent creation of modern house cats or dogs would not have been there, something most creation ministries acknowledge. As the film is done with science, so too shall we be done with the film. Though it does invoke this promise of more someday, with an angelic light descending to a tree. Presumably the tree of life, making this heavenly glow a fallen Satan or something? Much more than any individual detail we've discussed here on the Science of Genesis Paradise Lost, my desire is that the series will have demonstrated that you should always be skeptical of any claim, even mine. Over and over again, the movie used imprecise language, ignored key elements, and even misrepresented facts the speakers and editors should have known with only cursory investigation, all to sell a narrative they had decided on in advance, and went cherry-picking for any kind of support. Authority isn't a way to find truth, and scientific breakthroughs aren't distributed by 3D theatrical experiences. We hope you've enjoyed the science of Genesis, Paradise Lost, Fancy graphics and a cool-sounding narrator don't automatically make claims accurate. As always, please check everything for yourself. If you'd like to support the work of Apologia, please consider becoming a patron at the link in the description. Thanks for watching.